by oh there we go our recording uh just got started thank you may behind the scenes so um i am here with derek Torado, um and i will just let derek for a moment kind of speak about what you do and what your background is jenna um so i'm glad to be here i appreciate you inviting me your law firm inviting me uh, so my name is Derek Torado, as you said. I'm uh, a private investigator. I own my own private investigative agency here in High Springs, Florida. Um, I service uh, pretty much all of the north, north central Florida area. Um, I also do, uh, part of that is process serving. So I help law firms with uh, legal support, such as serving legal documents, but I also do consulting work like this, where I'm uh, presenting for crime prevention topics, also do security surveys, and so I kind of have a wide range of um, jobs and responsibilities in, in and my what's organization. Your, where did you come from? What was your background mm -hmm. before you started? Yeah, so um, I I started at the Gainesville Police Department, started my career back in 2000 as a police officer. And then uh, I went through different um, uh, roles essentially there. One of them was crime prevention unit. I did that for four years. And so on that unit, I was trained and um, helped uh, people in the community in the city of Gainesville uh, learn about crime prevention strategies. Uh, some of that was uh, geared towards senior citizen safety and awareness of scams, things like that. Same thing, security surveys, again, like I do now. Uh, and then eventually I rolled into a couple of other roles like uh, Oaks Mall officer. We used to have a, a couple of officers there at the time. And that kind of started my investigative career because that um, I ran into a lot of organized retail crime groups that we're traveling from uh, out of town and um, just really hit the mall. And I ended up uh, pressing them and following through. And that kind of got me some recognition for the police department. I love investigative work from that. And eventually that led to my detective career. And so I did burglary investigations and then um, eventually fraud moved into that. Uh, and so uh, when I was on the uh, fraud unit, essentially I mainly focused on uh, bank fraud, internet crimes, and uh, elder exploitation. And then after that, I retired. I had 20 years of service. Uh, that was 2020. At the end of that, I went into the banking industry. I had an opportunity to be a uh, drumming bank's fraud uh, and security officer. So I did that for a couple of years and I uh, was promoted to enterprise risk manager. And uh, so I dealt a lot with fraud when I was there at the bank. There was uh, a whole host of scams that uh, a lot of our customers and um, uh, account holders experienced. So uh, and then eventually that led me to here. The bank was sold. That led me into my career now, starting my own private investigation agency. That's wonderful. So you've got a, a wealth of experience, like in different areas with regard to fraud and different kinds of crimes as it relates to seniors um, and financial scams. So just to tidy up the housekeeping matters, we're going to go ahead and dive into the content, which is the subject of our webinar today. That is crime prevention strategies. Um, this is being recorded, so you can certainly, um, the link will be emailed out after to any of the participants. So if there's something that you've heard that you want to go back and review, um, you can certainly reference that. Um, Derek and I are kind of going to talk a little bit uh, back and forth for about 45 minutes. Um, and then we'll reserve 15 minutes at the end for a question and answer. Um, and I believe all you're going to need to do if you've got a question um, is, as we normally do, just put it in um, the, the question and answer function button, and then we'll read it off the screen and try to answer as many of those as, um, as we possibly can. All right. Housekeeping matters aside, um, let's get into it. So I think the first part that we want to kind of talk about um, when we're talking about preventing crime or preventing exploitation or preventing scams as it relates to the elderly, part one of that is really understanding what kind of scams are even out there, how to recognize them, what, what is going on these days, um, because they definitely have, um, like we can categorize them into these different buckets that Derek is going to go through, um, and they have like a particular pattern. So all that being said, let's talk about first, Derek, I think we wanted to go through some of the statistics in from 2022 in terms of what kind of, how big is this problem? This this problem is uh, astronomically big. Um, this is something where, I want you to think about the last time you heard of a bank robbery. Let's think about it. When's, when's the last time you heard that in the news? You probably haven't heard it in quite a while. There's a reason for that. Part of the reason is because 
Um, it is so easy to do fraud now, and it's so lucrative to do it. And the penalties, unfortunately, are a little bit less because it's considered just a property crime versus a robbery where it's a violent crime and, or forcible felony. And so why take that risk, go robbing a bank, you put yourself out there when you could just kind of scan people, right? You could do it very easily, very anonymously. You could do it over right. the phone, do it through the internet, et cetera. So just think about that. So that gives you an idea of kind of where we're at in the uh, society we're living in, the technology we all have, um, and that we have access to when it comes to how easy it is to do these things. So it is, it is risen uh, significantly. So, and then when we talk about, let's from there. So for the most part, yes, we're not having these big elaborate scams of people knocking on doors or breaking down walls and breaking down, uh, you know, windows or anything like that. So let's talk about some of the different types of scams that are going on. So let's go with phishing, first of all. So like, before we get into that, let me, let me go, let me get into the uh, statistics. So to piggyback on what I was just mentioning here. So in 2022, this is put out by the um, FBI. And it's uh, it's through actually IC3, which is a, a website that um, a lot of scams and such are reported to. Uh, so it's IC, IC3.gov. So it's IC3 victims over 60 by the numbers. So in 2022, uh, now keep in mind, this is just reported. This is You have to consider that none of, there's people who don't report this out of fear or embarrassment or whatever the case may be. 88,000 plus people, victims over 60, were targeted in, in 2022 with a 3.1 billion total dollar loss. Um, now, here's the big one. There was an 84% increase in losses from 2021, just the year prior. 84% increase. And the average dollar loss is over 35,000. And um, if a five, over 5,000 people lost so over 100,000. So that just gives you an idea where we're at. So, um, so what are some of the common scams you're seeing? Well, one of the biggest ones, and, and you have to understand that there's there's different, uh, they're, they're, they're very similar in nature. Uh, they come in different vehicles and packages, but essentially they're they're kind of all the same. Um, they have different flavors, if you, if you will. So for example, one of them would be a phishing scam. And that one's pretty broad. That one involves like uh, when uh, a bad actor is trying to contact you through uh, email, through telephone, through text message, uh, text message, uh, more uh, specifically, it's called smishing, SMS messages. Um, and so the ultimate goal, though, is to extract as much personal information from me as possible, your PIN numbers, your account numbers, um, anything of, uh, of significant value relating to your identity, even your so social security can, number. Can you give us an example? So when somebody's receiving that email or that text message, what, like, in general, are the component parts of what they should be on alert for with regard to phishing? Well, part of it is if it's unsolicited, that's a big one. So that's, a, that's the first red flag. If you didn't receive a message and it was unsolicited, um, or if it just looks out of the normal, that's kind of a red flag. That this problem is not legitimate. Um, the other thing is, for example, we see, um, I see these often, even my own mother sees them often. She tells me about them. Um, but uh, when I was at the bank, I saw them. You're going to see a lot of emails coming in now where it looks like it's from a legitimate source, PayPal, Amazon, whatever. And everybody pretty much uses those, okay? Or some people who don't, when they get that email, that to them alerts them and it says there was a $500 charge made on your PayPal account uh, or your Amazon account. Well, some people don't have those accounts, actually. <clears throat> and so that to them um, alerts them to think that, hey, they've been scammed, right? And so there's a phone number at the bottom that says you can call and you call them and it comes to a telecenter, wherever, overseas usually. And um, you go through this whole process where they are able to access your bank accounts, try to reverse the charge, and do all these other things to try to make it right. But eventually what they're doing is having you uh, transfer money to them. It's, it's kind of a smoke and mirrors game. Right. So that's right. one example of a common efficient scheme we see. Right. And the one thing too, I know for some of the people who have seen some of our other webinars, uh, particularly around exploitation, the exploitable brain, what we do know is as we age, our ability to, to even see or identify those red flags is diminished. There's that thinning of the cortical insula of the brain. And what we, you know, perhaps in our younger, more spry years can say, yes, I didn't do that. I didn't solicit that. This looks strange. Maybe, you know, in your 80s and 90s, 
that red flag isn't necessary, that connection isn't being made. Your risk detectors are kind of not as, um, you know, sharp as they had been. So that's why these scams end up being so successful. Anyways, Derek, let's go to some of the other ones. Yeah, so okay, along with phishing, um, you have people who will stay in line with the unsolicited messaging. So let's say it's whether Facebook or maybe you're on a dating website or whatever the case may be. Um, you get messaged by somebody and um, they strike up a conversation, you strike up a conversation with them and you both are getting along great. Uh, they send you photos, et cetera, and you find the person attractive. We're now moving into kind of a, the romance scam situation. And so that encompasses so, so many different types of scams, you know, whether it's wire fraud or P2P transfers or whatever. Romance scam is kind of the crux to all this. And um, so from that, they gain your confidence and trust, and you end up believing this individual. Maybe you're lonely, maybe you're a widow or a widower, and um, you want that attention, and this person's showing it to you. They're saying things to you that you want to hear. And so from that, uh, you kind of go along with it and you trust this individual, you know. Uh, but uh, over time, they're going to ask you to do things, send money for them, uh, open your bank account for them to have money tr being transferred through. And that's essentially they're using you for money laundering or they'll just bilk you of your actual own money. So, um, th so that's a common thing you see. And that's, again, unsolicited. A lot of times uh, they'll just they'll message you uh, on whatever platform you're on, if you're on social media, they'll probably message you that way. And they're prying, you, correct me if I'm wrong, Derek, on on at that point in your life, perhaps there is, like you said, a, a widow situation. There's perhaps a little bit of a feeling of social isolation, you know, not as you're not going to work every day. You're you're look, you're in a time in life where, you know, interacting and mm -hmm. um, uh, loneliness, uh -oh. sometimes it can, that can end up uh playing into the vulnerability of these romance or companionship scams. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> everybody wants to believe somebody, and especially in a relationship, there's a trust factor, right? Sure. And so when you are building this relationship and they're telling you things you want to hear, um, you know, honestly, sometimes it's um, it's like a um, uh, it's quid pro quo, you know, where you do for me, I do for you. Kind of, and honestly, sometimes it is like that, where they're getting the things they want to hear and then they're helping that individual with whatever. And sometimes they, sometimes these people even know they shouldn't be doing these things yet. They still do it because they're getting some benefit out of it, emotional benefit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think the, are we, the next one we do we want to talk about is check fraud. Yeah. Um, so let me hit on something real quick. Uh, there's a thing called pig butchering and that's a very uh, ominous sounding term. And it is uh, because uh, it, that is a common scam we're seeing now. And it, a lot of times that is involved with the you know, romance scam or whatnot. But this is something everybody here probably has received at some point over the past year or two. You get the unsolicited text message. Um, hey, you know, uh, when, when are we meeting for coffee? And then you reply, you have the wrong number. And the person says, oh, I'm so sorry to bother you. Hope I didn't, you know, hope I didn't bother you. And they kind of strike, strike over the conversation. And if you keep going and they keep going with it, that leads into this scam. And, event, and it's really a, an investment scam. And eventually they're going to kind of, if you keep going with it, they're going to roll into eventually uh, an investment type of scam where they're going to get you to buy in to uh, convince you to do cryptocurrency transfers or stock moves or whatever the case is. And the term pig butchering comes from uh, when you fatten up the pig before the slaughter. Well, that's what they're essentially doing. They, they are you know, taking as much advantage of you as they can and milking you or milking you of, of as much money as they can before they cut off the communication to end that relationship. So keep an eye out for that one. So if you've seen those texts, that's, that's going to be most likely a big butchering scam. So we're talking about check fraud. So um, this is a very big uh, issue right now. Now, believe it or not, checks are, have been, you know, they've been around for years and years, but believe it or not, it is the number one type of fraud that is occurring, financial fraud, um, that a lot of banks are experiencing. Um, you would think that it would be something like ACH transfers or whatever, all, all these other ways to kind of send money to people. But no, it's actually check fraud. Um, there and, are- there are people, On that, just for one second, funny enough, you know, again, for our um, senior community, you know, often technology and e-transfers and uh, Venmo or whatever other 
electronic mm -hmm. right. uh, payment isn't necessarily, you know, right. thing that they're most comfortable with. Even mm -hmm. with us, oftentimes we get, hey, do you mind if I just bring you in a check or can I mail a check? Right. So often because that's what they're most comfortable with. That's what they think is the most secure mm -hmm. method. However, that's exactly correct. Um, there is that false sense of security. Um, and it's something it may be a, a, in a senior citizen's age that they're just used to writing checks and they're just unfamiliar with, uh, you know, payment to payment situations or whatever. And they don't, you know, have a PayPal account or whatever. But yes, they they will fall back on or resort to checks um, and they'll just mail the check. And, but unfortunately, uh, we're seeing a lot of check fraud where um, you have groups of people, whether it's a group or uh, an organized group or their individuals that they are, um, uh, they they steal the mail, they will take the checks, they'll either, they'll either wash or alter them, and then find a willing accomplice to negotiate that check on their bank account, and then they get a cut of the money, but of course the first person gets the most money. Um, but there's actually a um, little more of a, it's kind of moved away from the check altering situation. Now it's more of, I'm going to post a picture of the check on a social media app like Telegram, where you literally have out in public, this is not dark web stuff, you have out in public through a, an app you and I could just download right now on our phone and join a certain group. Um, you can see certain groups where, let's say it's called the mailbox, for example, you'll see this individual, this is, this is a thief, He's, he could be a robber, maybe he robbed the, the, uh, the mail carrier. They're posting images of those checks that they stole They'll leave the account number off at the bottom and they'll say $100 for this, you know, $10,000 check or whatever. And what happens is they'll try to sell that check to another bad actor. They'll mail the check. They'll give them the image where that shows the uh, account number. And that person then uh, will counterfeit the check and then negotiate it somehow, you know, usually finding some kind of willing accomplice. So th that is so prevalent to, to this point that even the United States Postal Service has discouraged people from mailing checks in their own system. Um, so I personally do not try not to do that. I, I have vendors out there pay for, you know, for helping with the work. And sometimes they have to take checks, so I have to do it. But short of that, I really prefer to pay through credit card or ACH or something um, just because I don't want to deal with the uh, issues that I've seen so many times. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, all right. Now we're just, there's, we got a myriad of them here, but oh, let, yeah. phone scams. And now, so we talked about like written, right? Mm -hmm. Emails, text messages. Now it's sort of voice, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. we've got AI voice. What on earth is that? So let, let, before we get into AI, let's go into this. So the phone scam has been around for several years now. Um, and what this is, is you get, a, once again, an unsolicited phone call. Uh, usually it's somebody portraying themselves to be, and there's, again, variations of the scam. Uh, they could say that they are, um, you, you miss jury duty. And so you now have to pay a fee or a fine, or there's a warrant for your arrest. And nobody wants to get arrested and deal with that, of course. And, and it's it's easy maybe to miss jury duty, right? Maybe we missed it in the mail or we forgot to send the thing back, whatever the case may be. And uh, so we we believe this individual, maybe they sound credible. I'm deputy so-and-so with whatever sheriff's office, maybe it's your local sheriff's office. And so they scan you out of that. They'll have you pay through whatever method. Um, another common one is your grandchild's in jail. Uh, this is done where they say, uh, you know, you get a phone call from somebody who's saying that they're their attorney. Your grandson has been arrested in, you know, you know, Dallas, Texas or something, and I'm representing them. And if you want to bail them out, you could just send me the bail money. You could send it and mail it, uh, mail cash. Right. Like, cause that's legitimate, of course. Um, and so, uh, but anyway, so there's, there's that scam and there's just a whole, a whole host of them. Now, what we're seeing though more is with, uh, artificial intelligence, everybody's hearing that's a big buzzword and term now. Um, people's voices are actually being duplicated and replicated. It's a scary thing. So let's say, for example, um, uh, you post a video of yourself on Facebook or wherever, and you're just kind of doing a selfie video and you're talking. Well, scammers are able to get that, extract that video, use AI to replicate your voice and generate an entire narrative to whatever they want. So for example, usually you, see, you hear about a uh, kidnapping scam. So they'll use the voice 
of maybe your granddaughter. And they have now replicated that because they, again, extracted that from their social media. And by the way, they, they do their research. Somehow they tied in and figured out you or their grandma. Maybe you, maybe they, they tagged you in a post or whatever the case is. Um, they have now made that connection. And so now they're going for the kill, so to speak. And they're coming after you. And, they're, and they replicate the voice and makes it sound like they're crying. They're hysterical. I've been kidnapped. Um, I need you to send some money, the ransom money, whatever. And it's literally the voice of your granddaughter or grandson or at least sounds just like them. And it's very believable. The one way to combat that, though, we can talk about it later. But the main thing is you got to slow down. And the chance of somebody getting kidnapped and the calling the grandparent is going to be pretty slim. That's just the reality. And at that point, you should be able to call your granddaughter right away or the, the parents and make sure, you know, they're not there or like, you know, hey, granny, I'm over at my apartment. Right. What's going on? Cross, okay, well, cross now, reference. You, know, you cross right, you verify, right? So don't don't get into the emotions of it. And they're always gonna, you know, have you uh you know always fast paced, like, hey, you gotta do it now or else we'll kill her or whatever the case is. So um, but anyway, so that's a very common thing we're seeing now. It's a scary situation where voices are literally being replicated. So you gotta be even more wary of these things. Absolutely. So I know that like part of this is more not so much like the type of scam, but the form of payment of a scam, right? Mm -hmm. So what, when we start talking about like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, I mean, frankly, that's even a little bit of gibberish to me. Um, but where, where are you seeing that in terms of how does that fall into a scam situation? So there's, excuse me, there's a whole bunch of different ways that Scammers want money transferred to them because remember the ultimate goal is getting money to bad guy. Okay, from point A to point B, and there's different ways to do it. And one of the easier ways, or one of the um, uh, well, it's easier, but it's also uh, harder to catch them and harder to retract the money is through cryptocurrencies. So a lot of people are unfamiliar. Um, probably most people haven't actually purchased a cryptocurrency. Don't even know what it, what it is, but. Uh, just know the basics are it's it's a virtual currency. It's out there in, in cyberspace. It's on a blockchain. These are all technical terms that, you know, the, the computer nerds know mostly. And um, it's a recognized form of exchange. OK, just like the dollar bill is a form of exchange. It's a note. It's similar to that in the virtual sense. And so um, what happens is, let's say, for example, you are being romance scammed. And they want you to send five thousand uh, dollars to pay some kind of medical bill for them. Okay, and what they do is they'll give you direction. They are now ATMs that are designed and uh, built for a cryptocurrency exchange, and so they're put in convenience stores or wherever else, and they'll direct you to the nearest one. You go there, they'll send you now what's called a QR code. It's the little code you see scanned, you know, everywhere on TV or wherever else. You could literally walk up to the ATM and it'll scan that QR code. And then from there, um, it'll now conduct the transfer of those funds from your bank account or wherever else into or through this chain of events uh, and going into what are called digital wallets. And then from there, they transfer those, that, those funds through different um, other wallets. And eventually that gets to a point where they can extract the money on their end, let's say they're in Russia or something, they can extract it at an ATM or a bank, whatever, and now convert that. It's converted now to actual currency, digital, hard currency. And so that's kind of the method. So that's a very common one these scammers are using. It's very hard to retract because it goes very quickly. Um, there's it, it hits multiple wallets. You've got to be able to backtrack to those wallets um, and see who they're owned by, where they're at, and all that. It's very difficult, okay? Uh, it can be done, but it's again, it's very difficult. Um, but there's other methods too. Wire transfers, I had to do those. The ACH transfers, um, credit card, or, or uh, I should say gift cards. I had you buy those in $500 increments and then give them the number uh, on the back and you know, immediately cash it. So there's a whole host of uh, ways they can get that money. Absolutely. The last one that I want to talk about, because I don't want to miss out on time to talk about how do we prevent and what are some of the remedies. Um, the last one on our end, and, you know, we talk a lot about that and that's, um, you know, pursuant to 
Florida law, just exploitation of the elderly. So over 65, and then there's different increments. If it's over $50,000, that's a first degree felony. And the benefit that we have in Florida is that um, as of a couple of years ago, we have the same definition of exploitation in the criminal world that we do in the civil world. So anything that we, so anything that you can prove criminally, you can definitely prove civilly simply because it's a lower burden of proof in the civil world. Um, but what, what does that even look like? So from our perspective, it's oftentimes that we see this, it's a family member, it's a caregiver, um, it's a neighbor, it's a friend, um, and they get close enough um, to the vulnerable adult and, you know, influence them, whether it's influencing them into changing um, their, you know, durable powers of attorney, whether it's um, getting money for, you know, tasks around the house, and then $100 turns into $200, turns into $10,000, and then it's buying property. Um, and that is the most common method of exploitation that we see. It's the people closest to us. So a lot of these other crimes are, you know, a bad guy or a bad actor that you will never know who it is. But there is also a whole host of them that we see every single mm -hmm. day. That is the people closest to you. It is the people that are known to you. Um, and, and therefore, that's why we have all these exploitation laws that, that have come into being in Florida. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk a little bit about strategies to avoid some of these things. Um, I think Derek already went, you know, number one, easy one in, in relation to some of the types of crimes we've talked about is don't mail a check. <laughs> so that's, that's easy enough. Um, and we talked a little bit about somebody, if they're asking for personal information, whether it's via text or via email um, or even on the phone, if it's an unsolicited request for information or confirmation or verification, you know, full stop, let's cross check, let's cross reference. Um, and again, as we mentioned, that's going to be harder as years go on, because we know that our risk detectors uh, kind of dull as we age. So as best as possible, before you're jumping to bail your grandchild or, your grandchild. <laughs> or before you are going to transfer money or buy a gift card or, or what have you, stop. And maybe if you've got some trusted people around, if you can't independently verify by just picking up the phone and calling, maybe turn to some of your trusted people, whether that's a spouse, whether that's a child, whether that's a friend, um, your agent under a durable power of attorney, whomever that is, check with them ask for support around you. Um, let's, what what other ones have I missed from your perspective, Derek, that you see in terms of what can people arm themselves with to try to prevent this? I've got a few others that I'll go into, but I didn't want to miss anything. So I would say the biggest one is this, you, you definitely need to verify things that go slow. Um, if, it, if it seems too good to be true, what's the old adage? It probably is. Right. And so uh, when it comes to whether it's something you're meeting online, whether it's a, a text message saying you can have an amazing investment or uh, whatever the case is, um, you just got to slow it down. OK, there's no rush to anything. They always remember a, a common, uh, uh, common and uh, infamous, I guess, kind of sales tactic would be that pressure sale. Right. Where they if you don't act now, you're going to lose out on this deal or whatever. So they use the same tactics. Um, you know, if you don't do this now, this will happen, mm -hmm. this negative effect or whatever the case is. And so um, uh, they want to use fear, intimidation, um, uh, a, a concern that you may lose something. So just slow all that down. You don't need to, to rush into anything. Just verify. And remember, they these, these scammers know what they're doing. And so they're going to target people who they feel are going to be um, the most vulnerable who are not doing those things. If you're vetting them, and you're really feeling them out and everything, you're asking hard questions or whatever, they probably will actually back away themselves and move on to the next person because they feel like this person is not who we're looking for, right? So, um, but by doing that by itself, you probably will prevent some stuff. Um, but I would say just, uh, you definitely got to slow down, verify the information, always get a second set of eyes or opinion on them. That It's not going to hurt to do that. Um, but uh, just be careful with your emotions too, especially if it's online, you're meeting somebody don't do not let your emotions get in the mix because that will cloud your judgment. Yep. 
absolutely. We also, I mean, again, nothing is, is completely foolproof, but it's kind of putting all these little building blocks in place to hopefully arm yourself enough so that you, you, you're insulated. Um, so making sure, yes, you've got your trusted people, but also making sure that the trusted people that you have, have documents to support it. So having that act, like actually having a written, um, comprehensive durable power of attorney that's valid, uh, perhaps having a trust and some trustees because people can only help you with the authority that they actually are given. Um, and obviously be very careful on who you choose to put into those roles. Um, and, and if you've got trusted people and if you've got those agents, then then lean on them, use them. Um, another thing that we we do here for our clients is we arm them with something called the Careful app. I know we've talked about it before. Um, and the Careful app, in a nutshell, is oh. <laughs> an app that other your helpers have on their phone. And it kind of, if there is um, a transaction on um, the the bank accounts of somebody that we're kind of concerned about that is like over a certain amount, if it's going to weird sources, if there's um, a bunch of withdrawals coming out all you know, in a pattern or at the same time that are not verifiable, then an alert gets send, sent to the trusted helper. Um, because I mean, they're not, they're probably not, you know, monitoring every, their, you know, principals mm -hmm. make accounts, you know, every right. single day. So an alert just gets sent to them to say, Hey, just maybe have that conversation The the helper or the trusted agent can't access anything, but they can at least be alerted to have the conversation with the principal to say what's going on here. And maybe it all checks out, but it is just another level of reassurance, especially if you do have aging parents and as a, and if you are the child trying to look out for them and, and you've got a bunch of things going on, kids and work and whatever else, this is just another tool. Um, the last thing we wanted to talk about in terms of prevention strategy strategies before we jump into remedies is um, gifts by care um, agencies. What you were talking a lot about that to me um, when we were preparing for this, what does that look like? What does that mean, Derek? So we're talking about, you know, um, exploitation of the elderly through caregivers and such. And, you know, when I was a detective, I experienced that. When I was at the bank, I saw that. But particularly as a detective, I was a little more involved in the case and, and saw intimate things going on with the relationship and everything. And um, the common thing I noticed was a uh, common defense that's used by the offenders is that it was a gift. It was just a gift that she gave me. And, um, you know, it was a blessing, a gift or whatever term they want to use. And so um, <clears throat> in their mind, maybe and maybe in their mind, they think that. But the reality is um, it's it's beyond that, especially when it's a reoccurring thing um, uh, in, 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 in certain cases and then to play out for the jury to believe it either. So they're in prison. Um, but uh, yeah, so sometimes I've seen where it was a caregiver for a certain agency and usually it is some kind of agency involved. I'm not going to name any because there's several out there, but uh, uh, they are usually, these caregivers are usually independent contractors. We're talking about the ones that, you know, maybe a, a, the durable power attorney hires for that individual and they come in and clean for them or transport them, whatever the case is, little things like that to help them uh, come about maybe three days a week or whatever the case is. And so um, uh, they're usually hired through an agency. Well, that individual is a, is a is actually an independent contractor of that agency. They just contract with them. They're not really employees per se of the agency. And so what they're supposed to do though, there's certain conditions attached where if they are given gifts by the individual, maybe it's Christmas time or whatever the case is, or their birthday, maybe they're aware it's their birthday. Um, they don't really discourage that. If you want to give a gift, feel free to give a gift, but they, they, you really need to route that through the agency, not give it directly to the individual. Um, because you want to make sure everything looks clean, everybody, there's accountability there, especially with their agency that they're going through, route it through them. And a lot of times there's a clause in their contract that they do have to do that, that they have to notify them of any gifts received. And uh, that helps keep them accountable and it helps keep everything out in the open. So I would, I would highly recommend that you do that. If you know a family member who's doing that, uh, they're writing a little check out occasionally to their caregiver. If they're not doing it through the agency, I would recommend they do do that. Absolutely. Um, so the next thing is, okay, the scam occurs. Exploitation has happened. 
um, what do we do about it? Um, obviously, you know, we, we want to prevent as much as possible because when we, when funds leave accounts and they go into the dark web or they go overseas, there is very, very little recovery that can happen. I mean, you can mm -hmm. report to IC3, you can even make a report to the FBI, but honestly, it's, they have trouble tracking it once it's overseas. So the best strategy mm -hmm. is prevention. Um, but in the events that we have these known exploiters, we in Florida have this exploitation injunction, which we've talked a lot about. So I'm not going to go too into the weeds about exactly what we can do, but we can apply in the civil world for um, basically an asset. It's an application to the court for a temporary asset freeze. Um, we can also, we can do it ex parte, so we don't necessarily need to notify um, the exploiter. Um, we also can have a no contact order in place with the exploiter because the other thing that we know is exploitation ends up occurring when that bad actor has, you know, gotten really close to the vulnerable adult and has infiltrated and has become that person of trust. And when we can separate um, the bad actor from the vulnerable adult, it's almost like you stop um, the, the influence. So number one, it's asset freezing, meaning no more money out. Number two, it's um, a no contact, so separation from the bad actor. Mm -hmm. um, and we can also, from there, you know, there are other civil remedies that we can pursue to try to get a money back. Mm -hmm. uh, there's civil theft in Florida, you know, treble damages, um, a bunch of different things. But just on the exploitation, anything that we can do in the civil world, then you can either in tandem before or after make the same report to law enforcement of what has occurred and law enforcement can make their own investigation of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, the peanut power and investigative power of the state um, is, is huge. So mm -hmm. from there, you can have a civil injunction in place, but you can also pursue um, a criminal um, exploitation charge where that bad actor mm -hmm. actually has criminal pe penalties. Um, right. That's, I mean, you can make that report, law enforcement can do that investigation. Mm -hmm. The state attorney's office is going to have to make their own decision about charging. Um, so it's a long road there, but it, it's an available strategy. It's an available remedy. Um, and, you know, if we're talking $50,000 or more, which it usually is, that is a first degree felony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then um, the other thing, though, too, is we want to make sure that uh, the estate planning that you have is in place. So sometimes when we have vulnerable adults and hopefully they have some good estate planning and they have a trust. Another thing that we can do, typically in most trusts, there's a private decision-making uh, provision in that if the grantor and trustee, so let's say it's that vulnerable adult, has the ability to still manage their assets, usually that provision says something to the effect either co-trustees or income beneficiaries or children in conjunction with a written doctor's note can actually remove the trustee, the vulnerable adult, from the decision-making um, powers. It is still their assets. Nobody's taking them away from them, but they're probably no longer in a position to make um, sound financial decisions. So in the trust that they wrote, their successor trustees that they chose are going to step into place and kind of take over the financial management. Um, let's you go ahead and, you know, talk about the suspected abuse, Derek, while well, before we have to wrap up here. And, and so Cameron. Yeah. So obviously, uh, exploitation deals with an element of trust um, that they're being exploited. And that's part of the statutory definition that you have to have a, a, a person of uh, in a position of trust to uh, to involve exploitation. And so um, you have to consider that where you have to get over that first hurdle. You as a victim or a family member, do I want to pursue criminal remedies against this individual? Mm -hmm. This could be a family member. This could be whatever the situation so sometimes that might be kind of the first hurdle uh, you have to get over. Um, and once you make that decision, say, you know, they, they were wrong what they did, you know, they need, there needs to be some kind of recourse. Well, then, then you can start pursuing things. Like you said, <clears throat> the first thing is to stop the bleeding. Um, see, so you know, freeze the bank accounts, somehow attach them from the accounts if you can um, going forward. But, um, and then, of course, pursuing criminal remedies and, 
from an investigation to try to recover what you can. Um, but I wanted to touch on that. You're talking about now, are you talking about uh, financial exploitation now, or are you talking about physical? Uh, You're, I'm talking just them? about remedies and how, what as a private investigator you can do to kind of, one guess. of the biggest hurdles that we have mm -hmm. from a civil exploitation world is sometimes mm -hmm. just getting enough evidence to yes. build our case. So is there right. anything that you see that mm -hmm. can be helpful in aiding? Because it's like, I know that they're stealing from me. I know that that person's yeah. stealing from me, but how do we prove it not without the subpoena power of the state on the civil side? So that definitely is going to be the latter part of the, of the whole thing where let, now we're going to have to backtrack and figure out what happened and what all uh, what damage was done and if we can recover anything. So uh, from my detective years and even as a private investigator, it's basically going to be the same kind of uh, methodology and, and how to figure that out. And that's essentially, yeah, at, at least with these, the good thing is and this is usually a paper trail. Uh, a lot of times there's surveillance involved if they go to the bank of the individual or ATM. So, but time is of the essence. And so uh, because some of those things might eventually expire, uh, the video or whatever else. And so, yeah, so if you do hire a private investigator, for example, uh, what I would end up doing is working directly with the family, whoever has authority, a power of attorney, whatnot, over those finances. I want to look at those bank accounts. I want to see if that was the method. It was maybe they were writing checks out to them. Let's get a list now of all those checks. Let's go about uh, figure out when this individual came into picture. And from there forward, start looking at the accounts, see if there's anomalies and anything that's uh, unusual, whatnot. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, in, in cooperation with law enforcement, if they open investigation law enforcement, try to work with them, um, law enforcement side, it's essentially the same thing, except now they have, uh, they can just go right through the uh, state attorney for subpoena power if they need to, to subpoena bank account records or whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's essentially just working from backwards on forward, you know, and you look at the paper trail and, uh, try to get an idea of. The individual look into their life, the the offender that is with the suspect, and um, figure out you know what assets do they have? Did they convert that currency into an asset? You know, I worked a case where uh, they ended up um, buying a brand new Toyota Highlander for uh, the the caretaker, and it was like a forty seven thousand dollar vehicle, and she essentially essentially paid cash for that. And so um, I was able my investigation, and then I put out um, essentially a. Uh, uh, FCIC, NCIC hit where uh, the vehicle was found to seize it. And so we had seized the vehicle and it was there for, for years. We were in possession of it while the whole uh, case is going through. So that kind of thing needs to be done where if assets can be determined. Uh, let's see if we can get those maybe seized or, uh, you know, um, or whatnot. But, um, or if it's in maybe the victim's name, maybe pull it out and uh, convert it somehow to a way, maybe change the title if it's a vehicle. Or but those are those are just some ways you can kind of look yeah. into it. You know? Absolutely. Another thing, if it's an in-house thing, uh, from a PI side, you could uh, you could always hire a private investigator to put up uh, covert cameras. Of course, there's you know you want to make sure there's uh, some privacy concerns there um, that are addressed. But uh, you can put up covert cameras if maybe there's a particular room where the individual who keeps a wallet. Maybe, um, you know, the, the bad actors going in there looking at the credit card from taking money, whatever the case is, that can help prove those kinds of elements of crimes. And that can also help in abuse uh, abuse situations if you feel that there's uh, physical abuse going on or neglect. Absolutely. So two last things I want to touch on, and then I'm going to, if I don't see any questions in the uh, Q&A box right now. So if you have any questions, start dropping them in now, because uh, we're going to wrap up here in a moment and um take any questions if there are any. Um, but the two things uh, that I want to just end with are if there is suspected abuse, there's no substitution for um, making a report to Adult Protective Services. So that has to be first and foremost, because um, we do want to protect the elderly and a civil remedy is going to be far down the road from something that DCF can um, get involved in and, and move forward. Um, and then last thing is from the civil per from the civil side, um, you know, when we look at these crime prevention strategies, it is always better to keep, like we've been talking about, your trusted helpers in the loop, having good legal advice and counsel and documents in place, 
um, and ensuring that our family has the best care possible because we know that if they're, you know, feeling good and their quality of life is good and they're getting out and socializing and they're keeping their brains active and medications administered correctly, you know, hopefully they're going to be sharper to these sorts of things for longer. And in a, the last thing is we do ultimately, um, that's where our life care planning practice ends up kind of fitting that uh, space. And it is the space that we have found over the years with the transactional approach to working, um, well, anybody who needs estate planning, but particularly seniors with chronic illnesses, there was always a gap in the transaction of the the legal advice and the legal counsel, and then, you know, quality of life and um, involving the family and kind of surrounding the individuals, um, you know, in the, in the fourth chapter of their lives to make sure it's the best possible. So when we talk about that and a comprehensive approach to it, that's where we end up um, or where we have ended up um, going into this life care planning model. So anyways, that's just a uh, mm -hmm. little bit there. And I see one question, two questions that have come in. So let's, let's try to start address these. Um, the first question is, can you provide further details on how AI is used to uh, simulate real voices? You gave an example of a phone call from a family member in trouble. All right, that's on you. So further, a further detail on how AI simulates voices or what that scam looks like. Speaking from the technical standpoint of how um, the technical side of it works, I can't speak to that. I'm not an expert in uh, generating AI algorithms and whatnot. But um, essentially what it does is it takes uh, a voice and uh, AI is, is just that artificial intelligence. It, it's able to learn and replicate things um, that whatever is inputted into it, but it also has, it's like a computer brain where it's figuring out certain patterns, it'll uh, analyze voice stresses and whatnot. And so what they'll do is they'll take, let's say, however long of a clip of somebody speaking, 30 seconds or whatever or less, and that AI tech will figure out how to replicate the voice and in, in stresses and in, in inflections in words and, and uh, whatnot. And then if uh, whoever's inputting the information wants to have an inflection of fear or crying or something, they essentially put that into the uh, algorithm or into the uh, request of the AI and the AI will then generate that. So it kind of duplicates the voice that believes um, this is the voice pattern. So I'm gonna continue this voice pattern um, and, and duplicate that and say these are the words. So for example, if you, all you said on, uh, on a video was, um, you know, I love pizza. Um, well, the, the AI can, get an idea of your voice pattern and duplicate or replicate that into other words that are other than I love. Okay. It's just making an educated guess and it's, it's just utilizing some whatever formulas and, and um, uh, algorithms that has been created to use to do that. So it's learning and figures out, you know, how you speak. And so it replicates that. Now it's not going to be hundred percent perfect um, because it's not you actually doing it, uh, but it's very close, especially if it's done in a very, excited state you know where uh the, the, you know you know I'm, i've been kidnapped grandma da, 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 and it goes on and on if if remember the human brain if it just picks up on a few things and man this definitely sounds like my granddaughter it's her name or whatever else and it's her voice we're going to automatically assume the rest is going to be accurate we're going to automatically assume the rest is going to be that person right um and so it's just kind of how our brains work actually yeah. So I hope, I hope I answered that question. But, there, um, there was a bit of a follow-up. How do they actually get the voice? And I think the answer was they can get the voice anywhere. If there's videos that either you or your family members tag you in on social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever. Um, but actually my dad uh, had a call recently where um, the per the call, so it was a random number, an unsolicited um you know, phone call. And I don't know what the question was, but it said basically like, if, if you don't, if you want to avoid these charges, please state your name after the tone. And he did it. He goes, my, he say, says his name. And then mm -hmm. afterwards, unfortunately he goes, Oh no, I think that was one of these AI scams. And so then yes. he called the bank 
and he had to report it. Um, they live in Canada, to be fair, right. uh, to our, um, you know, federal fraud uh, department. And then he had to go through all these hoops because he felt that he got victim, fell victim to these scandals. Right. Agency, um, and institutions that he ended mm -hmm. up contacting. They said, yep, that's what's been happening. So an unsolicited phone call, state your name after the tone. You answer. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. You're done. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because yes, that is correct. That that's another thing is these scams that you're getting. It may uh, you know sound just like it's uh, you know hi, we're from AT and T. We need this and that and the other. Well, meantime, meanwhile, they're probably recording your voice, and so right. they're probably now incorporating that into AI tech and uh, furthering a scam somewhere else. Um, think of it this way: it's like a waste, not whatnot. So if you have like a product and you know, right. let's say it's an orange or something and you're going to make orange juice out of it. Well, then what do you do with the peel from that? You know, the, the rind or whatever. Well, now you can convert that to some kind of food or fertilizer or whatever. You're using the entire thing. So the scammers are doing the same thing. They want to maximize as much as they can from you. So whether uh, they're, they're not going to let your voice get away, so they're going to try to use it, you know, for AI related scams and, and some other things uh, could be your name or anything else you give them, any information. So, Absolutely. yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that, uh, sometimes there is a prompt, you know, uh, computers recognize that AI through the banks and whatnot is recognizing your voice. And so it's thinking that's you. And so uh, so if you ever get a call from a um, uh, scammer like that, I personally sometimes play along with it, but I change my voice all the time and, and, and just mess them up and waste their time so they don't waste, you know, scam somebody else in the meantime. But uh, yeah, just think about that. So just be very careful with, with, you know, with your voice being out there. The only other uh, comment really that we have in here is that um, if you're, you know, when we're talking about reports to DCF, when you're, when you suspect abuse, it's not that you have to have a case that you're presenting DCF with. Um, if you have a suspected abuse inkling, you make that phone call, you report it, it is now um, on the state who will actually do the investigation um, and take charge from there. So you don't have to build the case to bring it to DCF. It's it's sufficient that you suspect the abuse and therefore you go ahead and report it. And then it's the state's job from there to make that investigation. Um, okay, I don't see any more questions um, and we're re right up at um, 55 minutes. So I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, again, this is recorded, so you can, uh, it'll be emailed out to all the attendees after if there's something that you want to go back and listen to or, or had to leave early or what have you. Um, and we thank you all for joining us. And uh, again, I'm Jenna, uh, an attorney here at the Miller Elder Law Firm. Thank you so much, Derek, for joining us. It was, um, you're a wealth of information, so we appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully uh, we can do this again sometime. So everybody have right. a lovely and uh, we'll see you all soon. Take all care, right. everybody. Stay safe.